Greetings, everyone. Welcome to live lecture number 14 for Business Analytics 6356 on this lovely November 21st, 2023, as we're approaching the holiday season and the upcoming Thanksgiving uh, holiday as my family is starting to arrive into town and I'm getting to spend a little bit of time tonight with my non-relational database family. So really happy to be here with you all tonight and I know there's a lot of places you all can be so I'm uh, happy that you've chosen to uh, be here spending some time with me and with each other as uh, tonight is a little bit of a uh, bittersweet evening. Uh, bitter because it is uh, our last kind of regular class meeting together. Next week, of course, we'll be doing our part two case project presentation. So our time together this semester is uh, kind of coming to an end, but perhaps a little bit sweet because we get to take a little bit of time to uh, reflect on all the things we've learned and see how they kind of come together in a, uh, in a holistic manner. And uh, hopefully you can uh, appreciate and you take great pride in all the things you have learned because it's been a, a long journey and a lot of uh, great things that you've picked up as we've discussed these seven different databases of Postgres, HBase, MongoDB, CouchDB, Neo4j, Redis, and DynamoDB. That's a lot of really great resume fodder, a lot of great material for your CV, and great things to talk about in job interviews and skills to take back uh, to your current job. So hopefully you, uh, you feel great about everything you've learned this semester, and we'll use that to, of course, go forth into the world and do great things. That's, uh, that's the goal here, and uh, hopefully what we... Uh, what we're accomplishing, but of course, in preparation for tonight, we had a little bit of uh, a little bit of preparatory work to do. Uh, of course, reading chapter nine in the Perkins Seven Databases in Seven Weeks book. Uh, it's a really nice kind, of, nice kind of short and concise chapter. That's a little bit of a. Uh, kind of a cliff's notes, just a summary of all of the different genres and types of databases that we've covered. Uh, chapter uh, 12 in the Harrison Next Generation Databases book, and then kind of optionally, or at least for some of you, uh, completed assignment five. So as is described in the syllabus, while there are five assignments, uh, only your four highest assignment grades count towards your grade. So the lowest grade is dropped, and at this point in the semester, uh, it's often the case that students have done quite well on the first four assignments and uh, they'll kind of opt out of assignment five, which is not so much a technical assignment, but uh, as you saw, kind of a, a survey of the landscape of key value databases and an opportunity to share and talk about some, uh, some use cases. So I saw a couple of you have submitted assignment five and, uh, and that's great. I'll be, uh, I'll be grading that soon. Uh, I think at this point with regard to grading, uh, everything except for assignment five is graded. I have posted grades for the uh, part one of the case project. Uh, most of the groups did, uh, did quite well uh, as reflected in the comments that I gave you during your live presentation as I went through the uh, reports and the presentations that were uploaded. I didn't really see a lot of things that I didn't feel like I had already addressed uh, verbally during your presentations. But if you do want more feedback or guidance, I would be happy to provide that. Uh, and indeed, I think I will be meeting with all four of the groups uh, sometime tomorrow uh, to talk about part two. And if you want some additional feedback on part one, I would be happy to do that then. So on, uh, on tonight's agenda, uh, just a couple of little pieces of uh, administration, which uh, actually I've kind of talked about most of that uh, already, but a little bit about of administration. And then we're gonna talk about this idea of polyglot persistence, which is using multiple database management systems kind of in concert with one another to unlock capabilities that are kind of greater than the sum of their parts. So it's a really uh, kind of interesting way of thinking about 
data management, about application development, about analytics, uh, all of these uh, you know different relative, re relevant kind of interconnected fields. So we'll talk a bit about polyglot persistence, and then I've got a video from a uh, AWS reInvent conference. Uh, a couple of years ago where Andy Jassy, who was at that time the CEO of AWS and now is the CEO of Amazon as a whole, uh, talks a bit about his perspective and the Amazon perspective on uh, data management and cloud computing and a lot of really uh, interesting insights there that I want to discuss. So uh, I'll share the link to that video. We'll all take a little bit of time to watch that on our own as well as have a little bit of a break uh, kind of in the middle of class period like we uh, normally do. We'll come back, have a little bit of discussion about that AWS video and then uh, kind of wrap up with a a combination of exam readiness quiz one and two, because I know when I had to cancel class unexpectedly a few weeks ago, uh, we didn't get to have that first exam readiness quiz. And I promised you I would make that up to you both in getting the content to you and doing it in such a way that uh, there was no, uh, I guess, negative outcome, no, uh, nothing that should add to your stress of, uh, of grades. So we're going to kind of combine exam readiness quiz one and two with a review session for the exam. And it's going to just be a, an opportunity for you all to uh, see some exam questions, to contribute, to discuss. And uh, I think at the end of class, everyone's going to walk away with good understanding and, uh, and good credit on this and the ability to just kind of ask me anything you want about uh, the uh, the content, the exams, the databases, uh, whatever it is you are you are interested in. So that's uh, AMA, as in ask me anything. And then uh, we'll have just a few minutes of closing to kind of uh, wrap things up. So I think uh, with the included video break here, which this is going to be about 30 minutes because the video I think is 26 minutes and we'll add in a few extra minutes for break. I think we will be going until probably about 8.30 this evening. So anyway, that's uh, what we have on the agenda for tonight. Uh, the administrative stuff, uh, I already said, hey, congratulations. As of about 10 minutes ago, you are done with uh, all of your assignments. Lowest assignment score is uh, dropped. So if you didn't do assignment five, that will be dropped. If you did do assignment five and did well on it, then uh, whatever your other uh, lowest grade is will be dropped. We'll be doing our combination uh, exam readiness quiz one slash two today, which uh, each one of those was intended to be 5% of your grade. So uh, that's going to be 10% of your grade coming from that. Uh, do keep in mind, which I know is at the forefront of everyone's mind, uh, case project presentation two is next week. Uh, and I do have meetings uh, with all the groups uh, scheduled for tomorrow. And then uh, that final 20% of your grade will be coming from the final exam, which is to be held on during the exam period time, uh, Thursday, December 7th at 5 p.m. And we'll dedicate an hour and a half to that. Uh, the exam will be administered via Canvas. Uh, as I've mentioned previously in the semester, since we have covered so many different databases with so many different query languages, query languages, uh, some of which are not very intuitive and like easy to remember and kind of write off the top of your head. Remember the uh, the uh, syntax for querying. HBase, for example, quite convoluted. CouchDB was not super straightforward, right? So I'm not going to expect you to be able to replicate that kind of coding uh, unassisted on the exam. Now, I may show you some code, right? Code snippets from each of the different databases we've looked at and ask you to identify what the database is or identify in the code what is happening, right? Kind of reverse engineering, kind of deciphering what's going on because I feel like that is a very valuable skill to have. If you can, you know, walk into a meeting or walk into a conference room and you just see some documentation, you see some code that's been written on the whiteboard or whatever and be able to go, oh, hey, they're using a, 
they're using Neo4j, right? Or hey, they're using MongoDB for this project. This is something I know, this is something I could uh, contribute to. Maybe I need to go hook up with that group and, uh, and offer my services, you know? Um, so, you know, being able, even if you're not fluently writing the code, being able to read and decipher and identify, I think is a really valuable thing. And then also the kind of higher level conceptual stuff is going to be a big focus on the exam where you're really kind of uh, demonstrating that you know the different kind of business cases or use cases for these databases. And you could walk into a project and be like, yeah, this sounds like a, uh, you know, a good opportunity to use a graph database or, hey, we should really consider doing this in DynamoDB because we need this kind of global scalability and consistent performance at scale, right? Or, hey, maybe, you know, Redis would be great to speed up our, uh, our data access, right? So understanding those special use cases for each of the databases uh, is kind of the type of, uh, type of thinking that you should be doing on the exam, you know, and just kind of some general, uh, you know, demonstrating knowledge of each of these uh, databases, but not, not writing any code, nothing that is particularly uh, technical in nature. All right, so we'll have more kind of sample uh, exam questions and uh, opportunity to ask questions a little bit later in class. But before that, uh, another piece of administration around the case projects. Uh, just like for part one, I'm going to be asking that you upload your written report and your presentation materials uh, to Blackboard, or I'm sorry, to Canvas. Let's see if I can... Uh, see there we go to canvas by 5 p.m. on Tuesday November 28th so uploading them to canvas about an hour before class uh, which gives me a little bit of time to kind of quickly scan through get a good feel for what you're doing and uh, and kind of be generating some questions in my head and of course like before only one person per group needs to do this. If more than one person does it, it just gets more confusing on my end. And then additionally, each student should upload their confidential group evaluation form uh, by midnight on Tuesday night. And in that form, as it's described in the uh, instructions, you'll have a number of points to allocate that is equal to 10 times the number of members in your group. So if you have four members in your group, you have 40 points to allocate, it would be completely reasonable to give everyone 10 points if everyone contributed equally, or maybe you give one person 11 or 12 points because they went above and beyond, but then you have to take those one or two points away from other members of your group. And as long as nothing gets way out of balance, it's not going to affect anyone's grade. I just kind of like seeing who's making big contributions and, and things like that. Um, now, if everyone in your group says, uh, you know, Bob gets two points because he didn't show up to the meetings, he didn't contribute, he didn't do any of the analysis, uh, that's when I might need to have a, uh, a talk. But uh, generally, this winds up not being a big problem. So upload your uh, group evaluation forms. Uh, we'll have four groups. Uh, each group is going to be an allocated, allocated a total of 30 minutes. So your presentation, uh, you know, think about 15 to 20 minutes of actual presenting, and then probably five to 10 minutes of question and answer from uh, myself and uh, hopefully other uh, students as well. And so there is a, a question about the, uh, about the exam here. Uh, is it proctored through Zoom or open book, open notes? So the, uh, it's going to be through uh, Canvas, we're not going to have a live Zoom meeting, uh, but we'll have the lockdown browser stuff uh, in place and uh, it will be closed book, closed note, just the uh, you know content that is in your head is the, uh, is the goal there. All right, so that's kind of our administrative pieces. 
Uh, so now I want to go ahead, or unless there are any other questions, comments, or concerns, I'd be happy to address that. Otherwise, we can go ahead and move into the evening's content. So, of course, if you do have questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or, uh, or you can drop a question in the chat here. All right, so hearing none and seeing none, we'll move on to this idea of polyglot persistence. So uh, polyglot persistence is a term kind of borrowed from this idea of polyglot programming, which kind of borrows the term from polyglot, which is someone who can speak multiple languages, uh, like in like English, Spanish, French, and German, or whatever. Uh, but this idea of polyglot programming uh, came about, well, I don't know when it really came about, but I think it really came into prominence uh, maybe around the early 2000s, right? And this, it's this idea that instead of being dedicated to one programming language like Java or C Sharp or Python or uh, what have you, that you should select the right programming language for whatever task it is, whatever job it is you're trying to accomplish, right? Uh, because there are certain programming languages that are kind of better or more well suited to certain tasks than others, okay? And this is a departure from the way many companies and many organizations ran their application development uh, organizations some, you know, 20 plus years ago. You would often see companies say, you know, we are, we're a Java shop or we're a C++ shop or a COBOL shop and we hire programmers that know this particular language because everything we do in our company, we write in that language, right? And there are still some places that are primarily like focused on, uh, you know, a certain programming language or something like that. But more and more you see application development methodologies moving toward this idea of a service-oriented architecture or microservices or these systems where instead of one big monolithic application uh, that does everything, you have a lot of small independent applications that pass data between one another, often through things like API, application programming interface calls, right? And so in this way, we can develop these individual pieces of a system using whatever, uh, whatever programming language makes the most sense, right? And it gives us more modularity and we can uh, use you know, one piece of a system for multiple different systems when we have everything kind of independent like that in this service-oriented architecture type of uh, type of environment, right? So that's the idea of polyglot programming. And polyglot persistence is kind of the same idea that it's like, hey, there's no one database management system or not even one genre of database management system that's going to be the best at solving all problems. So maybe we need to take our, our big problem and split it up into a bunch of smaller problems and we can solve or address each one of these smaller problems with the tool that makes the most sense, right? So at this point, we've talked about these seven different databases in the five different genres. And we said each of these things, each of these databases have their pros and cons. So I wanna think about this at just a very high level uh, for just a couple of minutes. So. Of course, we started this semester with uh, our one relational database that we've talked about, PostgreSQL, or just Postgres, right? And so as a relational database, very good for ad hoc queries. We talked about this idea of query pliancy, right? We say with relational databases, since we have predefined the structure of our data, we've created this schema, Okay, we have a very strict definition of what our data looks like. That gives us the ability to ask and answer really any question we want to about that data. Okay, we don't have to think about our questions ahead of time because we thought about the structure of our data ahead of time, right? And this is very different than most of our non-relational database 
uh, kind of philosophies, right? And we said, I think it was in the very first or maybe the second week of class, that with a relational database, we know what our data looks like ahead of time, but we don't necessarily know what questions we want to answer with that data. And with a non-relational database, we kind of spin that around and we say, we don't know what our data is going to look like ahead of time, but we do know what question we want to answer with that data, right? So that's a very different way of thinking about our design, okay? So we want to structure, for example, like our HBase database in such a way that, man, we may not know what all data we're gonna have about our customer, but we know what we want to do with the data is just get all the data we have about a customer as fast as we possibly can, right? Or maybe we structure our data differently. We say, okay, we want to get all of the data about a product as fast as we can, but we don't have to know what that data about products is going to look like, right? So that's kind of the difference at a very high level in most relational and non-relational databases. So uh, yeah, with a relational database, since we have this schema, we get this benefit of query pliancy. Also, one of the things that's really the best thing and also the worst thing about relational databases is this idea of ACID compliance. That all of our transac transactions are atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. That is incredibly valuable when we want to ensure that we have a high level of consistency. And for many applications, this is incredibly important. Something like banking, right? We want to make sure that we do not lose a single transaction, right? And that if someone is transferring money and they withdraw money from one account and deposit that money into another account, that either both of those things happen or neither one of those things happen. It's like an all or nothing situation. So relational databases are great at that. Non-relational databases, generally speaking, can't handle like that level of, uh, that level of consistency, right? Because they are designed to be massively scalable. Right? And when you get into this idea of web scale data and you've got databases like database servers distributed all across the, across the globe, it becomes impossible to maintain ACID compliance, right? And this is why we've had to kind of move away in many cases from relational databases into these, this new genre of uh, non-relational databases that we're talking about. So. Acid compliance, super valuable, but also very limiting for having the ability to scale out. Relational databases can scale up very well. Okay, we can add more CPU, more memory, more hard disk space to like an individual server or a cluster of servers that's located together. Okay, but relational databases don't handle scaling out, having, you know, many, many servers uh, serving the same, uh, the same data very well, okay? So that's kind of the pros and cons of our relational databases. I've mentioned HBase a couple of times at this point, so very good at storing big data. This is really what uh, column family databases and HBase in particular uh, kind of hang their hat on, right? That we can store many terabytes of data. We could have trillions of records and we have one thing we want to do, and that is to be able to find one specific record as quickly as possible. So we talked a lot about how uh, HBase being integrated with, uh, with the Hadoop distributed platform, uh, creating MapReduce jobs and managing different regions that are handled by different region servers, uh, make it uh, or give it the capability to really quickly find you know, this one row based on searching for a row key and return that back to, uh, to the user. So great at finding you know, one individual record and a huge data source. We can scale out uh, you know, at two very large scales. We can have thousands of nodes in our HBase environment as some players like Facebook and uh, Yahoo and others have, but our ad hoc query ability was very limited. Okay, so searching by row key is the way to do it. We 
did have the ability to search on any other column family qualifier. However, our performance was quite hampered because one, HBase stores all values as binary blobs of data. So anything we're searching for, we have to first convert to a binary blob, and then we search through all of our rows, but we can't even be guaranteed that every row is going to have a value or even have the column family qualifier that we're looking for. So it's very, very inefficient. And then if we want to do any type of more complex querying, we have to start getting involved with MapReduce jobs. And we saw when we interacted with HBase using Hive, how much overhead there is with that. And some queries that might take just like less than a second in Postgres would take 15, 17, 20 seconds to run in HBase because you have this overhead of creating the MapReduce jobs and aggregating the results and displaying them back to the users. And yeah, it just, it wasn't great for a lot of small queries, right? It said that HBase does not scale down well. It doesn't do little things well. Now, if you had something that is going to take, uh, you know, 10 hours to do in Postgres, HBase might be better, right? Because we can spend that five or six minutes scaling up our MapReduce jobs, distribute that processing, and then aggregate the results back, right? So if you've got a big job, maybe HBase is great. If you've got a small job, probably not so much, right? Pros and cons. We also talked about these uh, object-oriented uh, or document databases. So MongoDB uh, has a lot of support within the community, especially in the object-oriented programming community, because uh, we don't have to break our uh, break objects down into individual attributes to store the values like we do with a relational database. Uh, but we can just store these entire JSON documents in the database, right? So great for interacting with uh, object-oriented data doesn't have any kind of concept of relationships between our data though, like we might get from a relational database. So uh, yeah, great in this object-oriented mindset, but we lose a lot of the uh, kind of power and the queryability that we have with, uh, with our relational database. So I don't know, you often see uh, document databases get us just getting dropped in in the place of a relational database, but you go, I don't know, is that the right answer? Because you're giving up a lot of your queryability and your relationships and your and things like that. So I don't know, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes maybe not. So hopefully now you know when it will and will not make sense. Uh, CouchDB, you know, similarly a, a document database all about uh, JavaScript object notation or a JSON and really kind of hangs its hat on uh, this idea of being incredibly resilient. A cluster of unreliable commodity hardware, right? This idea that uh, everything is going to fail at some point. You're gonna have servers fail, you're gonna have network failures, you're gonna have uh, you know, sporadic network access. And CouchDB has a very robust uh, replication scheme that allows a server that's been disconnected for some period of time to come back into the fold and kind of reliably be able to get the most up-to-date data. So great for these kind of unreliable, uh, unreliable environments, but has really the least queryability of any of the databases we've looked at. Um, really for all of our queries, we had to write these MapReduce jobs ahead of time, right? Very easy to access those queries once we've created them. It's just a matter of sending uh, an HTTP REST request to the server, just like a web service call basically. Um, and that data comes back as a JSON payload, but we have to define all of our queries ahead of time. There really is no ad hoc queryability whatsoever. Neo4j are graph databases. Uh, graph databases are all about relationships, even more so than a relational database, right? Because if you think about in a relational database, really the relationship still isn't a thing that actually exists, 
right? We have our relations, our tables in the database, but the only reason there is a relationship between those tables is because of that foreign key constraint, right? And we just say that, hey, here's two attributes in these two different tables that share a common domain. And so we're going to join these tables together based on that condition of equality. Okay, so the relationship is like a concept that we come up with, but it doesn't actually exist in a relational database. In a graph database, the relationship is every bit as much an object in the database as the nodes that the relationship is between, right? So, you know, you've got professors and classes and students. Those all exist in the database, but that relationship between professors and classes and students and classes, that relationship exists as an object as well. So it's much more robust. It's not, um, you know, it's not just a, a constraint. It's an actual thing in the database. And because of this graph, nature this is based in the in the mathematical branch of uh, of graph theory because of the graph nature of a graph database um, we can traverse complex and even unbounded relationships with a linear level of complexity okay so with a relational database once you get more than four or five or six levels deep into a relationship you get this situation where your complexity your computational complexity starts increasing logarithmically right so you get this like super steep slope because if you think about a situation where you're looking for uh, you know a person's friend right that's one level deep but then you want that friend's friends that's two levels deep and then all of those friends friends right so think about like connections on facebook or linkedin or something like that i'm friends with adam and adam is friends with bob and bob is friends with chris right being able to understand that i'm connected to chris through adam and bob right that gets very complicated for a relational database for a graph database that's just one two three hops that's not a hard problem at all right so Neo4j and other graph databases is all about relationships, not really what you want to use for storing like all of your data about some individual object, right? You don't want to put all of your customer data or all of your product data or something like that into a graph database. This is just not, very, not a very efficient mechanism of storage, right? So what you would probably want to do in this case is use something like Postgres or MongoDB or HBase or whatever as your like source of truth, like all of your data about your customers, but then periodically just uh, just do a do an ETL and extract, transform, and load. Take some of the data about the customers, their unique identifier and the products they purchased, or whatever it is you want to use to create this graph. Export that out of your you know relational or document or whatever database and import those relevant bits into your graph database to like kind of create all your connections and, and understand those relationships. So um, yeah, so that's graphs. And then uh, in our final fifth and final genre, the key value data store, uh, of course, we looked at Redis, which is an in memory database, very fast because we're not storing anything to disk, right? All of our data is stored in memory. But then that's also the bad thing about it because it is not persistent. Uh, anything that we have stored in memory, when the server is shut down or loses power or crashes or whatever, it is gone away and poof, it's uh, kind of ephemeral in nature. So uh, we'll often see Redis used as like a, uh, as a proxy. So something to uh, speed up our, uh, our data access as a caching server or uh, maybe something that if we have a lot of like data mining or data warehousing or analytical queries we want to do, we might load all of our data from Postgres into Redis and then query the Redis server because it's going to be so much faster. But then 
once all the data is lost out of Redis, we still have a copy of the data stored elsewhere, right? That would be a kind of common use case. And then the final uh, database we talked about this semester, um, DynamoDB, highly scalable. In fact, uh, for all practical intents and purposes, we might even consider this to be an infinitely scalable uh, global database uh, network, right? Because this runs on top of the massive Amazon AWS uh, cloud, right? And so DynamoDB kind of uh, sells itself as being uh, consistently high performance at any scale, right? So most of these databases will start off very fast, but then the more and more data you load into them, eventually like performance will start to uh, be impacted a little bit. Uh, Amazon claims that is not the case with uh, DynamoDB, that whether you have 100 records or 100 billion records, your uh, persistent, your, your performance is going to be consistent, right? So awesome that it is so, uh, so scalable, so performant, but uh, as you saw in the videos that you watched for last week, the access patterns can become a little bit complicated. It can be a little bit convoluted to be able to create kind of relationships and uh, express more uh, more complex ideas in DynamoDB. But once you kind of get the hang of it, it is something that is uh, that is quite powerful. So I say this is highly scalable and I claim that it is almost effectively infinitely scalable, but I do want to take just a moment to kind of think about the scale of the Amazon web services, the AWS uh, infrastructure. So this is something that uh, Amazon has been growing since the early 2000s. And currently, uh, AWS is made up of 25 what they call regions that are spread around the world. So regions roughly correspond to like major kind of geographic areas, right? So there is a uh, uh, I think a couple actually of uh, AWS regions on the west coast of the United States, a couple on the east coast, uh, one in the central US, there's a few around Europe and Asia, Australia, South America, like there are regions kind of close to like all of the major cities around the world. So 25 regions and regions are made up of somewhere between two and five what they call availability zones, okay? So an avail availability zone you might think of as being roughly equivalent to a data center or like one building full of computers, okay? So 25 regions that all have at least two, maybe up to five, but they say usually three availability zones, okay? An availability zone is made up of somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 servers. Okay, so 25 regions, uh, usually three availability zones. I think uh, I saw somewhere that there is a total of 81 availability zones currently that make up uh, AWS. And then each availability zone has between 100,000 and 300,000 servers. So if you do the math there, uh, that means the AWS infrastructure is made up of somewhere between 8.1 million and 24.3 million servers, right? So somewhere between like eight and 24 million servers that make up the AWS infrastructure. Like that is a lot of computing power, right? And I imagine a non-trivial amount of that is dedicated to running like DynamoDB type workloads. So I don't know, really, interesting to think about the fact that you can just go to aws.amazon.com and click on a few buttons and like Amazon will carve you out a little bit of uh, processing power from these uh, millions and millions and millions of machines that make up the uh, the AWS infrastructure. And uh, well, I, I should have mentioned like going into this, like these are not numbers that Amazon publishes, right? This is why I've got this very wide range of probably somewhere between 8 and 24 million servers because they don't really come out and say this, but if you watch enough Amazon AWS uh, presentations and you can find them all over uh, YouTube, 
you know, different, uh, different engineers will talk about, you know, the number of servers, the number of availability zones, the number of regions, things like that. So you can kind of get a rough idea of the scale, but uh, it's, wow, it's really, it's just a different class of computing. It's a different way of thinking about how you can manage your company's computing workload, your data management, distribution of data to get close to customers no matter where they are in the world. Uh, yeah, cloud computing is a, a pretty fascinating, pretty fascinating topic. And I'm glad we've got to cover just a little bit of it uh, in class this semester, right? But anyway, uh, so as, uh, as we've talked about, you know, all of these databases have some things that are great about them and some things that are not so great about them. So this is the idea of polyglot persistence is, hey, what if we use more than one of these databases so that we can take advantage of the good things and avoid the, uh, the negatives, right? So in chapter eight of the, uh, of the Perkins book and primarily in, in day three of chapter eight, it gives an example of polyglot persistence and it's talking about uh, bands and musicians and instruments and things like that. Uh, and it uses, you know, Redis for rapid population of cache lookups and then CouchDB to be the primary like uh, system of truth and Neo4j. And there's a whole bunch of different like little node.js applications that have to be running for, uh, for all this to work. And if you, uh, if you have been following along with the exercises in the book, like it's a, a very interesting exercise, like it's neat. It was kind of challenging to get working a couple of semesters ago when, uh, when I went through it. But as I went through that exercise described in the book, um, it kind of occurred to me that that in particular was a bit more focused on developers rather than like someone who is interested in data analytics. So that's why I didn't like ask you all to really dive deeply into that. Um, but you know, I think it is still something that's worth reading and kind of, uh, kind of thinking about a little bit. And if you're interested in playing around with that, uh, just like for the other examples in the book, the, uh, the code is available on the uh, on the book publisher's website, which is uh, pragprog.com, and then you can just search for the seven databases in uh, in seven weeks. So you know something to kind of think about there. But um, I wanted to talk about kind of another example of polyglot persistence that I think might be a little bit more relevant to you all, and maybe a little bit more uh, aligned with your actual real world experiences and something that you can kind of be a little bit more tangible about, right? And so I want to think about polyglot persistence in like a, a commerce setting, right? Or in particular with a grocery store, right? And this could be any kind of store uh, and it could be any grocery store. I typically, or I uh, personally have been shopping at uh, Kroger for the past uh, 20 years or so. I know uh, many of you, if you're a uh, Texas natives, probably uh, shop at uh, HEB, but I don't know, I just kind of grew up with Kroger and that's my, uh, my normal grocery store. So I'll be using that kind of in these examples, but uh, you know, this really applies to any type of, uh, of grocery store or kind of commerce system. But if you think about the different access patterns, the different kinds of use cases, the different types of data management that something like a grocery store might need to do, right? You've got a lot of different, a lot of different problems to solve, right? You know, one, you've got to keep track of your inventory, right? How many uh, instances of a particular product do we have on the shelves? at any point in time, right? How many boxes of Cheerios and Cinnamon Toast Crunch? How many gallons of milk? How many cartons of eggs, right? When do we need to reorder to like keep our, keep our stock in, right? We gotta keep track of inventory. We've gotta keep track of all of the different stores in our networks and the warehouses and the employees that work in the stores, right? So there's a lot of kind of logistical things that are happening there. We've gotta record all of the transactions, all the, all the times that a customer purchases a product. And if you think about 
all of the things that happen when you purchase a product. Like there's a lot going on, right? You wheel your cart through Kroger or HEB or whatever, and you put your, uh, your, your bag of Doritos into your cart, and then you wheel it up to the, to the cashier, right? And when you scan that product over the little red laser and it reads that UPC code, well, there's got to be a database lookup, right? So the, the cash register sends that UPS, UPC code to some database, which is going to return the name of the product and the price of the product because we've got to print that on the receipt, right? But then at the same time, we have to go update the inventory database to say, hey, there's one fewer bag uh, bags of Doritos on the shelf now. And then... If I used my loyalty shopper's card, right? We've also got to go and say, you know, customer XYZ just purchased this product at this time at this store and purchase these other products in the same transaction because we want to understand who our customers are, what their shopping preferences are, what types of things they buy, so we can more effectively market toward them, right? So yeah, we're looking up the price and the name, we're updating our inventory, we're updating our customer data, and then if you think about what types of things a grocery store is going to want to do with their customer data, like there are I guess a limited number of different types of customers that shop at your, uh, at your grocery store, right? And of course, every individual is a little bit different, but a 22-year-old single bachelor without kids, male, is going to purchase different things, generally speaking, than a 40-year-old female with children, right? Like these are just two different demographics that are gonna have different purchasing patterns, right? And 20-something bachelor men, right? You can kind of group them into a category of expected purchases, right? Just like you can older married men with children, right? Or divorced men or, you know, whatever. So you start getting these kinds of clusters of customers that you can make some assumptions that they're going to have similar types of purchasing behaviors, right? And you can look at, hey, uh, you purchased, you know, product A, B, C, and D, and other people in your group also purchase product E. Why are you not purchasing product E? Like, do we just need to advertise that to you? Do we need to get a coupon to you? Like, are you just not aware that this thing exists, right? Maybe we can make your life a little better by introducing you to this product and simultaneously make, make more sales, right? So kind of understanding what types of products are purchased together, right? So things like uh, hamburger meat, and hamburger buns and ketchup and beer and Coca-Cola, right? These are five products that are often purchased at the same time. So if we, as a grocery store, understand that, maybe we can make your shopping experience more efficient by putting the burger meat and the burger buns and the ketchup and the beer and the Coke all close to one another, right? So now your, uh, your experience is more efficient. Or maybe, maybe, just maybe, we're not really concerned about your efficiency because we want you to see the entire store, right? So maybe we put the hamburger buns on one side of the store and the beer and the Coke in the middle and the hamburger meat on the other side of the store. So now you've got to come in and you've got to go to all corners of the store and maybe along the way you're going to walk by the potato chips or the cookies. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, actually, I'm going to stop and get, get this extra stuff as well. I need a little snack, right? I don't know. A lot of different approaches you might take based on your understanding of your, uh, of your customers. But what database should we use, you know, in pursuit of creating a system like this? And as we've mentioned several times throughout the semester, there is not 
one correct answer. And in fact, you could probably meet all of these goals with any of the databases that we've talked about this semester. Like you could probably make Neo4j do all this. You could make Redis do all this. You could make uh, HBase do all this, right? Some of these aren't going to be the most effective or efficient uh, way to do it, but you could make it work. But I will say, if you were going to force me to pick just one database to do this, I mean, like a relational database is probably going to be, you know, your best kind of Swiss Army knife uh, tool for getting whatever done, right? But we can, uh, we can make things better. We can make things more effective, right? So let's start with this uh, last use case of finding customers that are similar to one another so that we can recommend products, right? So what we might want to do in this case is take this relevant customer data and do an ETL and extract, transform, and load out of Postgres and into Neo4j to create these clusters, right? So like I was talking about earlier, like our demographic data about your gender and your age and your marital status and whether or not you have kids, right? Because when you fill out like your application for these shopper loyalty cards, like that's the kind of information they ask you for. What's your date of birth? Are you married or are you single? Like uh, things like that. And then as those statuses change, it's not like I've got to go update uh, my, my demographic details with, with Kroger, right? They just figure this out as I start buying baby formula and diapers and baby food and stuff like that. Like your shopping patterns actually kind of reveal that type of information about you, right? But, you know, maybe we keep our core customer information in Postgres, and then periodically we just do this ETL, we export the data and put it into Neo4j, and we start looking at these cl these clusters of, uh, you know, 20-something uh, males, 20-something females, 30-something males, married versus unmarried versus uh, whatever else, and creating these clusters and what products they purchase and things like that. Like, that is a perfect... Uh, use case for a graph database like Neo4j, looking at relationships between customers, between different types of products, between customers and products, things like that. We might call this something like association rule mining, right? If you hear about the idea of a basket of goods, like that's uh, it's kind of the type of analysis we would use Neo4j here, right? So yeah, here's our first kind of step into polyglot persistence. Now let's think about this, uh, this next use case about uh, tracking customers, right? Because what if you had very, very rich customer data and many, many customers? Okay, so like I mentioned, I've been shopping at Kroger for about 20 years, right? I've had my Kroger customer loyalty card for about 20 years. And over the past 20 years, I would say either myself or someone in my family that shares my loyalty card account uh, has probably gone shopping for groceries about once a week, right? So 52 trips in a year times 20 years, that's about a thousand transactions that I've had with Kroger, right? And in each one of these transactions, probably purchasing 20 to 30 products, right? So that's 20 or 30,000 instances of data Kroger has about what products it is I or someone in my family likes to purchase, right? That's, that's a lot of data, 20 or 30,000 purchases. And then Kroger probably has, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions or even tens of millions of customers across the United States, right? Who all have many, many purchases like this. So that's uh, that's kind of interesting. But then also, because I am a, a Kroger customer and I earn fuel points with my loyalty card, right? I, uh, I get my gas at the Kroger uh, gas stations, right? 
So now Kroger knows what per what products I'm purchasing. Uh, also knows like where I like to fill up my car, right? There's a Kroger gas station near my house and one near work, right? Kroger knows approximately how much I'm driving because it knows how often I'm filling up my car. They know what Kroger locations I'm shopping at, right? Because this started years and years ago in Memphis, Tennessee, and then I moved to Nashville, and then to Tucson, Arizona, and now to Houston, Texas. So Kroger knows kind of how I've moved around the country, knows that I visit Memphis during the holidays because that's where my wife's family is, and I'll you know stop and get food for the kids or something like that at the Kroger. So wow, that's a lot of really very rich data. Kroger understands a lot about me. And I'm not really picking on Kroger, like any, any shopper loyalty program. This is kind of the types of data that they're salivating over, right? The types of uh, the things, the way they want to understand their customer. And then something that's relatively recent, but that is a super rich source of data is, uh, is during the uh, pandemic. Right, This idea of online grocery shopping, which had been kind of a minor thing for a number of years, but became very prevalent. And the reason that this is so much more data rich, if you think about your experience in a brick and mortar grocery store, the only data the grocery store really gets is what was your final product decision? What product did you ultimately wind up purchasing? But in an online shopping scenario, uh, we, we are able to capture what we call click stream data, right? So every click you make on the website, on the Kroger website, really any e-commerce site, I'm not picking on Kroger here, this is just common practice. Everything you click on gets captured, gets logged, right? And they know how much time you're spending looking at product A, and product B, right? Did you debate between two different brands before making your ultimate purchase decision? Did you debate between the 12 ounce size and the 30 ounce size before making a decision? How long did it take you to make that decision or did you just immediately know what it was you wanted to purchase? Wow, that's very rich data, a very deep insight into kind of your thinking during this, uh, this purchasing decision, right? But that gets to be a lot of data, right? If you're tracking that for all your customers. So we've got a lot of customers, we've got a lot of data, but also this might be very sparse data, right? Because maybe not all customers would have data about online shopping, or maybe not all customers are using the fuel points or something like that. But if I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of data, a lot of sparse data, you know, maybe I want to keep this really rich customer data in something like HBase. They can deal with this huge amount of data and with the sparse data, keep my most relevant customer information, right? Your name, address, phone number, email address, credit card number, all of that stuff in Postgres put my transactions and some basic customer data into Neo4j. And so now we're kind of getting, getting uh, some, uh, some valuable use out of a lot of different things. If you think about your sales transactions, right? When you've made this purchase and you have a receipt of your, uh, a receipt of what it is you've purchased, if you look at a receipt you get from any, you know, modern big box department store, grocery store, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, you'll typically find a QR code or a barcode or at a minimum, some type of unique identification code for that transaction, right? Because if you go to return a product at some point in the future, the cashier, the customer service rep, is going to scan that code and be able to look up exactly what it was you purchased. But if you think about kind of how inefficient it would be for them to look up individually each product and then look that up in the product table and return the name of the product and the price and what you paid for it on that date and all these things, like that gets to be a lot of uh, joins that would have to happen 
in a relational database. But above and beyond that, we're not really interested in what the current price of the product is, what the current price of the item is. We want to know what it was when you purchased it, right? Because if you bought something for $5 and now the price has increased to $7, well, we want to refund you the seven dollars or the five dollars you paid, not the seven dollars that it is now, right? So what we really want to do is to create kind of a snapshot of that point in time of that receipt, right? And that receipt is basically a document, right? Something that would be very well suited to store in a document database like MongoDB. Right? So maybe we you know, store our receipts of all of our transactions in MongoDB. We also have information about the transactions and the customers in Neo4j, so we can create these great kind of association rules and these graphs of how everything and everyone is interconnected. Our rich customer data in Apache HBase and kind of our uh, transactional stuff in, uh, in Postgres. Yeah, it seems like by using these four DBMSs together, like we could really reap some great benefits above and beyond what we could with any one of them individually. So this is just kind of at a high level, an example of how we might implement polyglot persistence for a use case that you're perhaps uh, kind of familiar up with. And you could probably think of a lot of different examples in uh, various domains. Of course, in, the, in uh, Houston, the energy sector is a very big, uh, very big thing. Uh, so, you know, you might think about uh, sensors out in, a, in an oil field or in a wind farm out in West Texas or something like that. And maybe you have, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, wind turbines, right? And you've got dozens of sensors on each one of them uh, picking or, you, or measuring the vibration and the velocity at which the turbine is spinning and the heat that's being generated and things like that. And we're getting hundreds of readings a second from these hundreds of different uh, devices. So this gets to be a very high velocity of data, right? A lot for any one system to take in. But maybe we don't really need that granularity of data outside of being able to alert for something that is becoming problematic, right? So we could use something like Redis to take in this rapid stream of data and then aggregate that up to the you know one second or five second or five minute or whatever level of analysis makes sense and then store that in some persistent database uh, like MongoDB or something like CouchDB if we're wanting to be very tolerant of our network failures right maybe we need to uh, maybe we don't have reliable internet access out in a uh, the wind field in, uh, in West Texas, right? So we wanna store something in CouchDB and then every four hours, you know, a Starlink satellite is going above us and we get internet connectivity for 20 minutes and our CouchDB can like uh, reassociate and replicate that data uh, back you know, to our servers in the, uh, in the data center or, or into the cloud, right? So, yeah, you know, we might have a bunch of different databases kind of working in concert together for something like that. If you think about a supply chain context, you know, maybe our, uh, our inventory and our list of vendors and things like that might be very well served by a structured relational database like, uh, like Postgres, right? But then to really understand the complexity of our full value chain, right? And if we have multiple vendors that are able to supply uh, a particular product in multiple warehouses and shipping routes and things like that, a graph database like Neo4j might be able to provide some value. And then if we're talking about sharing data between multiple vendors and multiple suppliers and things like that, kind of the uh, encapsulation and the portability of a document like a JSON document might be very useful, right? So maybe we've got a bunch of data stored in Postgres that we ETL out into uh, MongoDB or CouchDB so that we can share these JSON uh, documents amongst vendors that are using whatever other data management uh, systems and solutions that they uh, have in place. Or in a, uh, in a, like a gaming or an entertainment context, right? Uh, you know, if you develop a new app 
or a new game or, or whatever, uh, things go viral, right? And that happens uh, very quickly and with very little notice. And it's great when something you've done goes viral, I guess, but uh, also if you're not prepared for that, uh, it's possible that your service would like be overwhelmed and might become unavailable. And that's not a great thing. This used to be a very common occurrence uh, prior to cloud computing. Uh, so back in the like early and mid 2000s, uh, it was often referred to as the slash dot effect because there was a very popular tech website called slash dot. And when something got posted to slash dot, everybody would be like, oh man, I want to go check out this thing. And this website that had previously beginning like a few dozen hits per minute is getting like a thousand hits or a thousand visits per minute and it would crash the website. They would call it the slash dot effect or getting hugged to death because everyone wants to go give this website or this service or this game or whatever some love. They want to give it a hug, but if you get a thousand people hugging you, it, it smothers you, right? Um, but if you embrace something that is scalable like Cloud computing and DynamoDB, for example, when you get this big uptick in traffic, you can scale, you can meet that demand. So something like DynamoDB is, uh, is great for that, right? And maybe, you know, if you know you're going to be getting a lot of traffic, you can put something, uh, a caching service like Redis or Elasticsearch or something like that uh, in front of that. So, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of possibilities here. Uh, of course, things like this also get used in uh, law enforcement and fraud investigation, like graph databases are really big for identifying um, things like criminal networks or people that are conspiring together, right? You might be able to identify in a graph network or in a graph database um, if you have, you know, a group of employees that don't really have any reason that they should be together all the time, but hey, look at this. They're like actually checking into the, or like signing into the same building at the same time. Like what's going on? Like why are they kind of grouped together, right? They're logging into the same systems or, you know, just kind of weird access patterns. So this is something that happens in law enforcement, fraud investigations, um, in a healthcare setting. You know, this is a big thing since uh, COVID, like contact tracking, contact tracing. Uh, this is another good use case for uh, graph databases. Um, yeah, just a lot of uh, a lot of different a uh, lot of different potential use cases that you can think about here. So that's kind of you know at a high level this idea of polyglot persistence and uh, I uh, one of the goals for the uh, phase two of the case project. Uh, of course, you're all going to be identifying one or more new data sources to kind of incorporate with, uh, with what you did for part one, but then uh, hopefully also integrating one or more additional new uh, databases. And uh, what many groups have done in the past is to take what they did before, typically using either Postgres or MongoDB, and then add Neo4j, do some graph analysis on top of that. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting way that you might use polyglot persistence in your own, in your own project. But yeah, we'll talk more about that uh, in our group meetings that are upcoming. But before we do that, uh, we're going to have this video that we watch from uh, Andy Jassy, followed by our exam readiness quiz to kind of close out the night. So the way this is going to work is uh, when I click to the next slide, there's going to be a poll everywhere uh, activity activated uh, where you will see six topics from the class, uh, relational column family document graph key value databases, as well as a topic that just says general concepts. So you're going to order from one to six uh, how interested you are in reviewing these topics or the order in which you want to review the topics. So we'll have time to cover all six of these uh, topics in our, uh, in our review session, but we'll just kind of front load it with the stuff that you all express the most interest in. So there'll be three questions per topic, and then I'm happy to discuss anything else in any level of depth that you all 
uh, would like to. But we'll do three questions per topic. Uh, we'll spend a minute with you all answering the questions and then about a minute kind of discussing and making sure everyone uh, understands that. So the ERQ section will take you know about 35 minutes or so at the uh, end of class. So this should now be open on Poll Everywhere and I will leave this open for the duration of our break. Oh yeah, it's showing up for me. So we'll just leave that open there. All right, so here is the video that I am going to ask you all to watch. So I know I have talked a lot about Amazon and AWS throughout the semester, and I am not a uh, I'm not an employee of Amazon, and I'm not a corporate shill for uh, Amazon. I just uh, think it is pretty incredible this infrastructure that uh, that they have built, and it really enables a lot of uh, of amazing. Uh, computation and distribution of computing and data that just didn't exist some uh, some 20 years ago. They're just really good at doing this. And uh, this, I thought, was a particularly relevant and insightful video. And it is a couple of years old now, but uh, it's still, I think, very relevant to what we're talking about now. And uh, yeah, so this is from uh, the AWS. Uh, every year they have a conference called reInvent. Uh, but this is Andy Jassy, who at the time was the CEO of AWS. He's now the CEO of uh, Amazon. He took over at Amazon uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now. But a very good, dynamic presenter, very opinionated, as you're going to come to find, on kind of the old guard relational databases, your Oracle, your Microsoft uh, SQL Server, things like that. And uh, of course, a big proponent of uh, being a little bit more agile in the cloud. So he's got a lot to uh, talk about there. So this link, of course, is in the uh, slides that are already posted to Canvas. Uh, I'll also paste this link into the chat. Or uh, you can just, oh, that's weird. That didn't post, paste as text. That's like a picture. Try this again. Yeah, there you go. Now that's a link that you can uh, click on. Um, or if you just search for, uh, you know, AWS reInvent 2018 AWS databases, like this will be the first thing that pops up. So uh, this video is uh, about 26 minutes long. So uh, I think at this point it's uh, 7.15. We'll take a 30 minute break, right? Which will give you a uh, time to kind of stretch your legs, get a snack, use the restroom, whatever you need to do, as well as the uh, necessary 26 minutes to uh, watch this video. So go watch the video now. We'll reconvene at 7.45. We'll have a little bit of discussion about the video, and then we will move on to our exam readiness quiz and then kind of wrap up our content for the semester. So any questions, comments, or concerns before we go off and watch videos and have a break? All right, well, if not, uh, again, we'll reconvene in 30 minutes at 7.45. I will see you then. All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope you all had a nice, uh, a nice break and also had an opportunity to uh, watch this uh, video and I hope you really enjoyed it. I, uh, I know uh, at this point, this is a couple of years old and every semester I go back and I watch this video and I say, is there something newer, better, more relevant I can plug in here? And every year I go, man, I just really think this video is so to the point of really illustrating uh, what it is that we're uh, trying to cover in this class. So, you know, I think this is a, lot, a great resource. There of course been some developments uh, since uh, reInvent 2018. Uh, but you know, this is still very much in line with uh, kind of what the, uh, the state of the industry is. You know, a lot of great content here. And one of the things that 
Andy Jassy really talks about a lot in this video and many other videos that you will find uh, with him with him speaking uh, is this idea that companies really get entrenched in, in these old guard databases, the things like Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, and it can be difficult to change and, and adapt uh, and adopt the new emerging technologies. And there, there's kind of a, a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of funny saying uh, among IT professionals, and that's that, you know what, no one ever got fired for buying Microsoft. No one ever got fired for buying Cisco, right? If you want to just take the take the kind of easy route, right? Take the safest route. It's like uh, like buying a Toyota Camry. Like you're not going to get the fanciest, the best, the flashiest, the most performant, the whatever. But it's a solid, safe choice, right? Um, and that's kind of uh, kind of why a lot of companies stick with some of these old guard databases. Is it is the safe, tried and true choice. However, the world is uh, the world is changing, right? And web scale data and the ability to scale out and have global distribution of your data, we're getting to see these benefits above and beyond what. Uh, many relational databases can provide that make it now maybe more dangerous to not be adopting these new technologies and uh, and leveraging the capabilities of uh, of non-relational databases as uh, you know the price of of compute and storage resources continues to drop customer expectations continue to get bigger and bigger and uh, and things like that. It's like, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, it's not so risky to adopt these new technologies as maybe the risk is for a failing to adopt the new technology. So really a very uh, kind of exciting time to be involved in, uh, in information systems and in data analytics and, uh, and all of these wonderful things. And one of the phrases that he uses in this presentation, a time or two, and that you hear often, uh, often when we're talking about emerging technologies and things like that, is this idea of innovate and iterate, right? So when, so we get kind of iterative additions to the offerings from these services. We get new capabilities, new features added to these DVMS, as he talks about, like DynamoDB and Aurora and Neptune and these emerging blockchain databases and time series databases and things like that. So as these new features are made available, this gives developers and businesses opportunity to innovate by taking advantage of these new features, right? And as they more fully ad adopt these features and push them further and further to and past their limits, right? Then that brings on another wave of iteration and innovation and new features that are gonna be added to these systems which enable companies and developers to do more, which enables them or kind of uh, puts them in a position to ask for more uh, abilities and, uh, and features and things like that. So, you know, that's uh, one of the reasons that it's so valuable among like the open source community for, uh, for companies to kind of share their developments with the world because it enables everyone else to do bigger and better things, which then like kind of encourages the development of more sophisticated, more feature rich, more advanced systems. And it just becomes kind of this cycle of the, uh, the evolution and improvement of, uh, of technology overall. So it's all, uh, all very, uh, very exciting stuff. But if you enjoyed that video, I would highly recommend that you uh, search out additional, uh, you know, videos with Andy Jassy and in general from the uh, AWS reInvent conference because there is some really uh, great and uh, valuable material out there. But you know, one of the things to kind of think about from watching this video is, you know, what is the future? of data management, right? Because in this class, we've talked about these five genres of database management systems, relational, column, family, document, graph, and key value. 
But of course, that's not set in stone. And as we've seen throughout the semester, like also it's not like really strict lines that are drawn between these things. Like there are many database management systems that it's like, ah, this is kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a key value database, but also kind of a document database. Like that's how he describes uh, Dynamo as being a key value document database. Like many of these systems don't fit exactly into one bucket, right? So there's overlaps, there's databases that don't fit into any of these categories. You know, this is not uh, something that's set in stone. It's not, it's not canon, right? Um, there will be you know, additional types of database come out in the future. If you take this class again in uh, five or 10 years, we'll probably be talking about a completely different set of, uh, of technologies. But he, he mentions a couple of emerging things like time series databases that are used uh, you know, to process like streaming data. And we talked about the ability to do something like that with, uh, with a system like Redis, right? But that we need to handle this very high velocity of data from sensors or Internet of Things devices or self-driving cars or whatever it happens to be, right? But that we're, uh, we're worried about the kind of the temporal nature of the data. So that's, uh, you know, an emerging data management technology. And then also something that uh, is uh, kind of ebbs and flows through the, uh, through the news cycle, but this idea of, uh, of blockchain, right? and uh, immutable ledger databases, okay? So uh, you've probably all, you know, at least heard the term blockchain. And for most people, the first thing that you think of when you think blockchain is cryptocurrency, right? Your Bitcoin and your Ethereum and uh, things like that. Um, or maybe NFTs, the non-fungible tokens is something you think about as being related with, uh, with blockchain. But in reality, things like cryptocurrency are, are basically just kind of like a, an application or a use case that sits on top of blockchain, right? And what blockchain really is, is this distributed uh, ledger database. And there's many different flavors and many different use cases of that. And so, uh, you know, uh, Andy Jassy talks about the uh, quantum ledger database and the, uh, and the managed blockchain offerings that, uh, that AWS has. So, um, you know, regardless of your feelings about cryptocurrency or NFTs or anything like that, uh, blockchain is a pretty significant technology that is going to be very impactful to uh, you know, information systems and, and data management and analytics uh, for, the coming, uh, for the coming decades. So uh, a really important kind of foundational technology uh, that has other applications like cryptocurrency and things like that uh, running, running on top of it. So uh, definitely do keep your eye on uh, different blockchain offerings and, and who knows what other kind of uh, data management uh, tools and techniques will be developing in the uh, in the coming years. But, you know, regardless of what those are or what they look like, it's uh, it's unlikely that any will be like the magic bullet, the panacea that is just good for us solving everything. You know, there's always going to be multiple tools and you got to find the right tool for the job. So hopefully that is uh, some of the knowledge that you've been equipped with throughout this semester. All right, so happy to take any, uh, any questions that anyone may have or anything that anyone wants to bring up for discussion. But if there are no points of discussion, I think at this point we can transition into our exam readiness quiz slash kind of exam review uh, for the evening. So we have a lot of ground to cover across these six topics. So we'll move kind of quickly, but also we'll make sure you get the exposure you need to each one of these topics for the exam. So for each of the six topics, there'll be three questions, which will be presented via poll everywhere in the, uh, in the quiz format or in a, in a survey format. Don't fret too much about it. Just kind of go with your gut. 
Uh, as long as you contribute in a meaningful way, right? As long as you're able to answer most of the questions, uh, there won't be any kind of penalty for incorrect answers. We're all just about this being a learning experience. So uh, for each set of three questions, we'll give three minutes for you to respond individually, and then we will discuss each question about one minute per question. So six topics at six minutes each. Uh, this should be about a 36 minute exercise. Uh, you all suggested this as the order for uh, addressing the topics. So general concepts, key value, column family, document graph, and relational. And I have accordingly arranged the uh, pool everywhere activities that way. And uh, oh yeah, this is just kind of in here as a little bit of a, a buffer slide, but of course this is how we've looked at each one of our genres and databases throughout this semester. So at this point, we'll start with our first, uh, our first poll everywhere activity, which was going to be addressing general topics. So, uh, and this could be like cloud computing stuff or, you know, whatever it is we've talked about throughout the semester. And of course, if you're having any trouble with Poll Everywhere, you can always uh, just record your answers and email them to me and let me know that, hey, you were here doing the thing and Poll Everywhere just wasn't acting right. But anyway, we'll go ahead and start. So once this is activated, you should see a blue button that says Start Survey. So click that and get going. All right, our allocated time is reaching an end. So let's go ahead and get those last three surveys in. And then we'll move on to a, let's see, I guess individual question, discussion of what's going on. One more survey. All right, so the first question was about Putty. So now we should be individually answering the questions and I think we're going to have a lot of agreement on this as I'm looking at the answers that were originally submitted. But what is Putty used for? It's for querying a graph database, launching Amazon EC2 instances, connecting via SSH, or creating models. And I bet 100% of you know that yes indeed we've used Putty to connect to our Linux EC2 instances. Uh, to import data into uh, Postgres, to run the MongoDB client, Redis, uh, the Neo4j command line interface, all kinds of uh, all kinds of tools. So yeah, you all know Putty is just an SSH client. Great job on that. Question number two, in its most basic configuration, not setting up replication or clustering or doing anything fancy like that. Which DBMS is most likely to distribute data across multiple servers? Is it Neo4j, Redis, DynamoDB, or Postgres? And it looked like there was a little bit more uh, contention around the correct answer on this one. So we'll take a look here and we see, oh, no, people, I guess, have changed their minds and uh, congregated around DynamoDB, which uh, because it is built on this uh, globally distributed AWS network is uh, absolutely the correct answer here. Uh, Neo4j, we can cluster, but by default and for performance reasons, often we want to have this running on just one single uh, node. Uh, Redis, by nature of being an in-memory database, is really kind of forced to be just on one node. And uh, Postgres, our relational database, again, we can set up uh, clusters of relational database servers, uh, but again, scaling out is not really what uh, relational databases do. DynamoDB, just in its native configuration, is scaled out effectively infinitely. So great job on that. And then last but not least, for our relational questions, uh, which non-relational database management system genre was developed to allow developers to store objects without breaking them apart into their constituent attributes. So this is the object-oriented mindset. And 70% of you say it's the document database, right? Where we could take 
our uh, our objects in you know Java, Java or Python or C Sharp or whatever, and just store those objects directly in the database as a JSON document. So fantastic uh, work with uh, with that with those questions. <clears throat> of course, we uh, talked a bit about using Secure Shell connecting to Linux. We understood the basics of uh, some Linux commands. So navigating through the uh, uh, through a directory, some commands to import data into Postgres, DynamoDB, HBase, things like that. Uh, we saw how we can use curl to download a file directly from a website from the command line, things like that. We also uh, talked generally about some AWS concepts like Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2. That's how we uh, create our compute instances. If you went through the tutorial videos, you also had to do a little bit of work of configuring your uh, VPC network security or your virtual private cloud network security. Uh, we talked about the relational database service or RDS that was in the uh, Postgres tutorial video, as well as using Elastic MapReduce, which is how we hosted uh, our HBase instance. And then last week, we looked a bit at DynamoDB. We looked at creating uh, key pairs for authentication, talked a bit about Hadoop, HDFS, MapReduce, all these kind of general cloud topics. So, you know, above and beyond just the core data management content, hopefully you get some good uh, cloud computing content as well. All right, so next up, let's talk about our key value databases. So that quiz is activating now. We'll give three minutes and then we'll come back and review the questions. Question number one was looking at Redis. What does it mean when we say Redis is an in-memory database? And I think we're gonna have a lot of agreement here that data is stored only in memory, right? Meaning that our performance is very, very fast uh, but also that the uh, the data is stored in a volatile place. And if the server were to lose power, crash, get rebooted, whatever, uh, all of that data goes away. So typically with Redis, we want to have some other persistent store of data and then just use Redis for kind of the high performance uh, query ability. Now, of course, we can configure Redis to write data out to disk, but that's just not, you know, generally what it's uh, kind of strong suit is there so excellent job on that a lot of agreement and i see a fair amount of agree agreement on this next question as well talking about adding additional dynamo db servers to our environment these first three options give a lot of uh, kind of technical detail about stopping and starting services and migrating and backing up and things like that but almost all of you know that we don't actually have to do any of that. All that's just kind of handled magically in the background by Amazon as DynamoDB is a serverless offering. That doesn't mean that it doesn't run on servers. It most certainly does run on servers. It's just that we as the users don't have any responsibility or access or insight into what servers it's uh, that DynamoDB is running on. So we can't do any kind of administration like that. All just handled automatically in the background by Amazon. And then our third and final question also about DynamoDB and uh, a lot of varied answers on this one, what do we use to improve the performance of DynamoDB to quickly identify a subset of data that is stored together? Okay, so there was discuss some discussion of uh, our secondary indices that we can use to kind of uh, uh, create almost create relationships between uh, items in DynamoDB. But the way that we kind of have high performance of bringing back data that is, uh, that's kind of related to one another is by storing them under the same partition key, right? So your primary key in DynamoDB is a composite key that's made up of a partition key and a sort key. So the partition key kind of groups similar items together and then within those groupings, the sort key is what we would use to kind of uh, be our initial ordering of those items. And the sort key and the partition key together uh, would be unique. That would be 
our primary key, right? But your, uh, you might want your partition key to be something like uh, the state, right? Uh, so that you know all of your employees in a particular state are together, and then they have a sort key that uh, differentiates them within state, right? Or uh, you know maybe your partition key is the department or something like that. But anyway, partition key is what keeps uh, items in DynamoDB physically stored together so that they can be accessed with higher performance. So that's DynamoDB um, or well DynamoDB and uh, and Redis. Uh, of course, both key value data stores. Uh, Redis is all about very high performance and simple access. You know, generally not for persistent storage, but maybe, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of times faster uh, than kind of simple access we could get out of a relational database. And then DynamoDB, another key value, or maybe a key value document data store, if you want to uh, put it into that bucket, that is, uh, you know, globally scalable, almost infinitely scalable, and gives you consistently high performance course, hosted by uh, AWS, so we talk to it using the AWS API, a fast, robust, and fully managed service. All right. And of course, along the way, if you have questions, comments, concerns, want to talk more about something, please do let me know, and we can do that. But if not, we'll move on to our third quiz topic the column family database. So that's active now. Go ahead and get started and then we'll chat. All right, most excellent. All 15 surveys in. Let's see how we're feeling about our column family databases. So in, in HBase, adding a column family qualifier. Is this uh, a big deal or is this pretty easy to do? And it looks like the majority of you agree that it is computationally very inexpensive and can be done at any time. And in fact, you can't add a column family qualifier ahead of time. The only time you can add it is when you're writing uh, a data value into that column family qualifier. Uh, so adding a column family uh, is something that's a little bit more computationally intensive and you have to take the uh, database offline. It has to be distributed amongst all of the uh, worker nodes, but column family qualifiers, you can add anytime and, uh, and all the time. So that's just kind of the nature of HBase. Next up, if we're going to import data into HBase, where do we have to put the file into var lib import? Can it be anywhere? Does it have to be in the HDFS data store? Or does it need to be on the master server? So recall that when we did the import uh, activity, we did initially upload our file to the master server, but then one of the first things we did was run the, the command Hadoop FS dash copy from local and then uh, indicated our destination in the HDFS data store. So when you import data into HBase, all of your worker nodes like kind of take on part of the role of doing that data import. So it has to be somewhere that all of your worker nodes can access the data, which is of course in the HDFS or Hadoop distributed file system data store. All right, last but not least on column families, a tool for querying HBase in a SQL-like manner. Is it Hive, HDFS, Hadoop, or Gremlin? And I bet all of you are gonna know it is, well, almost all of you are gonna know it is Hive. So we use Hive to query HBase in a SQL-like manner using the language, Hive query language, or HQL, which is very, very similar to structured query language, or SQL, right? And so Hive was developed by Facebook just to make it easier uh, for their developers to interact with HBase because otherwise they would have to write all these complex MapReduce jobs, which some people know how to do, but not everyone knows how to do, but pretty much everyone, at least in 
developer land uh, knows how to write structured query language. So this was kind of bridging that gap a little bit. But as we demonstrated in class, there are some pretty significant performance implications uh, to doing so, to interacting uh, using Hive. So something to look out for there. But yeah, of course, HBase, column family database, all about dealing with the biggest of big data. We interacted with it using these really long, weird looking uh, Java and JRuby style commands. So not very user friendly from that perspective, uh, but you know, just the ability to deal with this uh, massive data and scale out, uh, you know, to as large as you can build a Hadoop cluster, which is several thousand nodes, uh, makes it pretty, pretty great for uh, dealing with big data. All right, next up, we're gonna look at a couple of questions regarding document databases. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, first up, what's the common way for interacting with CouchDB? HTTP REST? JavaScript, Couch Query Language, or Erlang. I think most of you are going to agree. Yeah, most of you, 89, 90%, that it is HTTP REST or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's just the standard way that we interact with the web server, request web pages, things like that. And then REST or Representational State Transfer. Um, and that's uh, yeah, just a common way that applications interact with one another and how we interact with uh, CouchDB. So very common kind of web-based uh, protocol or web application protocol. So nicely done on that. Question number two, what is one shortcoming of CouchDB? Lack of replication, no support for MapReduce, lack of ad hoc query ability or lack of ad hoc queries, or that reading and writing requires database drivers that are available only for Linux. Well, CouchDB is all about replication. All of our views are written in MapReduce. And like we just mentioned with the HTTP REST thing, uh, we're just making regular web service calls. So any type of computer that can interact with a web page can interact with CouchDB. So that must mean our shortcoming is the lack of ad hoc queries. Fantastic. And then last but not least, oh, MongoDB gets no love. These are all CouchDB questions. But how are views replicated between CouchDB instances? And let's see, I believe 100% of you know that views are just stored in documents which are replicated uh, just like any other document. They're stored in a special type of document called a design document. Okay, so then they just get replicated like magic, right? There's no real special configuration that happens like we might have with other uh, database management systems. So MongoDB, of course, one of the biggest names in the non-relational space. It gets a lot, of, uh, a lot of love from developers because it's, you know, works well with this object-oriented uh, mindset. Also works really well with uh, humongous data, which right there in the middle of the word humongous is where the name Mongo comes from. Uh, all about JavaScript object notation. And yeah, it's, you know, just a great document database. Uh, CouchDB, all about kind of uh, being integrated with a web application mindset. We interact with uh, HTTP REST. And uh, like MongoDB, you know, all of your data uh, comes and goes in JSON documents. But yeah, configuring our replication, very easy to do. Configuring replication is often a kind of tricky task with many uh, database management systems. Both CouchDB, uh, as we demonstrated in class, uh, is a very straightforward thing. You know, CouchDB is all about the replication. All right, for our, I think, fifth and next to last topic, graph databases. So let's go ahead and we'll give about three minutes here and get started. All of our surveys submitted, so let's go ahead and look at these questions individually. First of all, with our Cypher query language, which of the following is a valid Cypher query? So let's see, 
As I look at these, I know a cipher is a pattern-based language in which we're going to represent our nodes as being wrapped in parentheses and our relationship is being wrapped in square braces. So B is kind of the opposite of that. And D, well, we don't use these curly braces at all in, uh, in cipher. So it's either A or C, but also we know that these relationships are directional and we're going to be pointing like from one node to another, not from both nodes into the center. So I believe, like I believe all of you believe, A is the correct answer. So fantastic work on that. Moving on to number two, what, what is the benefit of index-free adjacency? Let's see, boy, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of words here. Let's see. About 67% of you say, since all nodes know what nodes they are connected to, graph traversal is computationally constant regardless of the size of the graph and that would be absolutely true, right? So basically what we're saying is, uh, or well, let's back this up a little bit. We saw that with many of our other DVMSs, we could create indexes and indexes uh, kind of sped up the uh, process of interacting with the values of that particular attribute that you created an index for, right? What this is saying is nodes know what other nodes they are adjacent to without any kind of index. It's index free, right? So without creating an index, every node knows which nodes it's connected to. Therefore, traversal of the graph is in constant time because to get from one node to the next node, we don't have to interact with an index. We don't have to look anything up. That node just knows like what all nodes it's connected to, right? So that's why we get this very uh, high performance of traversal of complex and even unbounded graphs. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with aggregate functions. Um, now we do do indexing in Neo4j, uh, but the indexing is just to help us identify one particular node, generally maybe the node that we want to start the traversal with. So. Indexing makes it faster to find the node where we want to start, but once we found that initial node, the traversal of the graph is in constant time, which is really nice. Oh my gosh, did I just spoil this next question? I forgot that this was the third question coming up. What does indexing speed up in a Neo4j if not graph traversal? Well, it must be, well, it's not graph traversal because we have index-free adjacency for our graph traversal. But yes, as uh, many of you are coalescing on now, finding an individual node in the graph is what indexing is uh, all about. So of course, the graph database we talked about in this class is, uh, is Neo4j. Um, another one you might wanna look into, and I need to do a little bit more uh, work on myself, is uh, Amazon's Neptune graph database. So something else to uh, kind of think about doing some research on. Uh, but yeah, you know, graphs are all about these complex interconnected networks. Uh, we learned the cipher query language. Um, yeah, so graphs are, uh, graphs are kind of neat. Now our sixth and final topic, the relational database that we're all perhaps the most familiar with. Let's go ahead and get started. We've got all our surveys in, so let's take a look at our last Round of questions here. We talked about some different fuzzy search operations. Which one finds the number of three character sets that overlap between two strings? So most of you picked up on the fact that uh, three, just like a, a tricycle has three wheels, a trigram has three characters, right? So we break our string up into uh, all possible sets of three characters and then we compare what the percentage of overlap is in order to find, uh, you know, do a, a similarity between two strings. So this can be very useful for 
uh, searching on terms that perhaps people specified the words out of order. I think we gave some examples like uh, instead of searching for gone with the wind, if someone searched for like the wind with which I am gone or something, that's going to have a very high match in a trigram analysis. Whereas something like a Levenstein distance, where we're looking at the number of individual transformations that have to occur, uh, or a lexeme or a metaphone, which are both phonetic matches, uh, would not be very good matches for that. So trigrams are about these three letter strings, T-R-I meaning three. All right, next up, if we wanted to speed up search operations on a particular attribute, oh my gosh, I feel like we just keep talking and keep talking about this topic, B, indexing. That's going to speed up search operations on a particular attribute. So if you have some particular attribute you know you're going to be uh, conducting searches on, like maybe your employee's uh, last name or something like that, you might create an index for that uh, so that you can access that more quickly. Um, also, whenever you're creating a relationship between uh, two tables in your database, typically you want to create an index on your foreign key because that's going to speed up the, uh, the join operations. But yes, indexing is all about speeding things up in a relational database. And then last but not least, what is a transaction? Is it an, a query that reads I think that should say every row, document, or node in a database. Is it a collection of operations that should be executed as all or nothing? Is it any query that writes to the database? Or is it a query that uses some calculative function, like our aggregate queries of some average count, things like that? And I believe most of you would agree, all of you would agree that it is be a collection of operations that should be executed as all or nothing. And kind of the classic example of a transaction is a bank transaction, like I mentioned earlier, uh, where you know if you're transferring money from checking to savings, that means you're withdrawing money from checking and depositing money to savings, and you want both of those things to happen or neither of those things to happen. But it's unacceptable for one to happen without the other. That's why we make that a single transaction. All right, so of course Postgres is the one relational database we talked about this uh, semester. It is a powerful, open source, uh, very active developer community. I mean, uh, this is what we see. I guess a lot of projects that need a relational database uh, kind of gravitating toward these days. Uh, Postgres, quite popular, as is uh, Aurora, like, uh, like was mentioned in the video, uh, if you want to be in kind of a cloud native world. But of course we interact with Postgres and other relational databases using structured query language. You know, it gives good performance, good queryability, things like that. There's kind of a different mindset than all of these non-relational databases we've talked about this semester. All right, so that is it for our, I guess, kind of combination ERQ1, ERQ2, and uh, exam review session. Uh, be happy to take any other questions you might have if anyone has anything they would like to pose. And of course, over the next couple of days and weeks, if anything comes up, I'm happy to uh, uh, help out via email or to set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting or, uh, uh, or have office hours next week, uh, anything, anything like that. So, uh, of course, if you have questions, reach out. But kind of the last thing that I want to leave you with this evening, and really, in fact, this semester, is kind of circling back to our very first night of class. And in the, uh, the asynchronous content for that first week, there was a lot of discussion around uh, the last 50 years in data management. And this kind of timeline of when relational databases were created, when they really came into prominence, other technology changes that have happened and what's kind of necessitated uh, this shift into non-relational database management. But I want to, once again, kind of 
emphasize my stance that although these non-relational databases are great and are really critical for the modern, you know, modern world of internet and web applications and things like that, uh, I really believe the uh, the SQL skills and the relational data modeling skills and things like that that you have developed alongside your understanding of these non-relational databases is going to continue to serve you well for, uh, for quite a while. There are many problems where relational databases are still a great solution. And I think, you know, uh, that's really kind of illustrated by the fact that, you know, these relational databases that were developed in the 70s and 80s are still heavily being used today, right? Even though technologies have changed so much, right? With the introduction of the internet and social media and mobile, like always on connectivity, right? It's like these have been massive changes and they have necessitated other technologies for sure, right? That's what we're seeing here. Uh, but yeah, relational databases are still a great uh, a great tool for a lot of problems. So, you know, I don't want you to think that these SQL skills you learned in your relational database class and that we've continued to talk about in this class are in any way obsolete or not valuable or anything like that because they are. And also, that knowledge is kind of the foundation by which we're able to like build up all of this understanding of data uh, and how we use them in non-relational databases. So, you know, these are just a lot of great technologies that kind of work in concert with one another. And the other thing that I want to, uh, I want to kind of re-emphasize is that I talked about in this very first video how Although the relational data model was proposed in 1970 and kind of developed at IBM uh, through the mid-70s, we didn't really see a lot of commercial development and adoption of relational databases by business until we get into like the late 80s and kind of early uh, 90s here, right? That there was this maybe 15, 10, 15 year incubation period where everyone was kind of trying to figure out the benefits and how to use relational databases and things like that. And then think about the fact that we are today in 2023, right? Which is like 10, 15 years past the point that we started seeing the introduction of non-relational databases, right? And because of the technology changes, like I think a lot of this adoption has had to be a bit more rapid, right? And things have been adopted a little bit more readily, but I just wanna, I kind of point this out to emphasize that you are, you all are on kind of the, the leading edge, just like the beginning of this like massive boom of the importance and the, and the different applications of, uh, of data management strategies like this. So, you know, I'm glad you're here. I hope you've learned a lot and I hope this is something that really brings you a lot of value now and, uh, and in the future. So, I don't know, great time to be doing what you're doing and I'm glad I could be part of that journey. But speaking of the journey, at the end of the journey every semester, I always like to kind of wrap back or wrap back around to say, you know, did we actually do out what we, or did we actually do what we set out to do? Because at the start of the semester, you were provided with a syllabus, and that syllabus is kind of like our contract of what we're going to be covering, how grades are going to work, my expectations, uh, things like that. And in particular, at the bottom of this uh, first page, there are these four learning objectives, right? And this is what I want to make sure that we all kind of agree that we hit, um, that we, one, describe the core principles, concepts, and applications of each database management system, right? And I think this is kind of summarized in that first slide that we start each new DBMS with when we talk about what type of database is it, what makes it different, how do we interact with it, how's the performance, how does, how's the scalability, like that set of, of questions. So, you know, I think we've talked a lot about that throughout the semester and then a lot tonight as we've talked about polyglot persistence and kind of the pros and cons 
of each one of the uh, different DBMSs that we've looked at this semester. Right? We've talked about matching DBMSs to uh, business problems and kind of their use cases, whether it's about uh, being highly reliable or very scalable or very fast or uh, having asset compliance and dealing with transactions well and pros and cons, things like that. So uh, again, throughout the whole semester, but in particular tonight, we've covered quite a bit of that. We, uh, we set out to make sure we could connect import data and run queries in each DVMS. And uh, we did that in multiple occurrences of each database, uh, both the examples in the seven databases in seven weeks book, our homework assignments, our in-class demos, and then for uh, several of the databases, your uh, case project presentations as well, right? That you would connect import data and run queries. So hopefully we feel comfortable with that. And that we've also learned some cloud computing concepts that are relevant to these types of systems, right? This uh, interactions that we've done with EC2, with Elastic MapReduce, um, in many of the tutorial videos, it walks you through setting up relational database services and Redis using uh, Elasticash and, uh, of course, connecting via Secure Shell using PuTTY to our EC2 instances and things like that. So, you know, even if those aren't directly data management related topics, those topics and getting a little bit of a core understanding of Linux and cloud computing and things like that will certainly serve you well through your career. So hopefully you all feel like we did accomplish what we set out to do. Um, I've been very pleased with the progression of, uh, of the class and seeing what you all have been able to accomplish in your assignments and your, uh, and your case projects and things like that. So uh, I feel good about what you all have learned. I hope you all feel good about what you have learned as well. Um, of course, I and the college and the university would really appreciate uh, feedback on what went well and what didn't go so well in the uh, course evaluations. So these were made available yesterday, I believe, on uh, Access UH. So uh, if you log into Access UH, you'll see a red icon like this. You just click on there and you can do your evaluation. These are, of course, completely anonymous. Uh, the only thing I see is a percentage of how many students have completed the evaluation, but I don't even see the names of who did and didn't complete the evaluations. Uh, and then about two weeks after grades are posted, I see aggregate scores and comments, but again, like not associated with students or anything like that. So yeah, it's, it's anonymous, but it's something that is important to me, uh, important to the university, and I would uh, strongly recommend you do that. And of course, if you enjoyed this course, you know, recommend it to others that are in the business analytics program or, or other programs that can take it as an elective. Uh, you know, the more the merrier. I love uh, sharing this knowledge and being able to work with students uh, in this way. So hopefully you all enjoyed the course. Uh, we're to the end of our allocated time tonight, but remember group presentations next week and for uh, I think all of the groups will be having one-on-one uh, -on -one group meetings tomorrow. Uh, so you should have received a Zoom link from me and uh, yeah, we'll meet at our allocated time. Final exam will be Thursday, December 7th at 5 p.m. on not Blackboard, but Canvas. And uh, yeah, please remember to complete the course evaluation. If you like the course, recommend it to your friend, or friends, friends, all your friends with an S. Um, and yeah, happy to take any questions you have. If you don't have any questions, you all go forth and do great things. Have a great rest of your evening, a great Thanksgiving, and I look forward to talking to you all tomorrow and seeing your presentations next week.